we've learned a little bit about how we find the causes of diseases, I'm going to tell you about how um, one of the ways that we use to uh, study uh, how a disease actually progresses in an individual, and that is through using model organisms. And specifically, I'm going to tell you a story about how we have learned about Alzheimer's disease using studies in model organisms. So you may first be wondering what even is a model organism. You may not have heard this term before, which is entirely fine. Um, and a model organism essentially is a type of living creature that we study as biologists in order to understand something about the biology of our own body. And this works because of the relatedness of different organisms. So what you're looking at here is essentially a family tree of different organisms. So um, just like a family tree you may have hanging on the wall at your grandmother's house, um, this is just a much longer time scale. So um, we humans are more closely related to the mouse um, than we are to uh, the roundworm or baker's yeast because our common ancestors are farther back on this tree. So just like your most recent common ancestor with your sibling is your parent, that's a closer relationship than your most recent common ancestor with your fourth cousin, which would be your fifth grade grandparent. So I'm going to talk specifically about mice, which we share a common ancestor with mice about 90 million years ago. Um, and I'm also going to talk about baker's yeast, which um, our last common ancestor was 1,500 million years ago. So we're much more distantly related to um, yeast than we are to mice. So we use model organisms because they have specific advantages for uh, doing biological research. Um, so, as you already heard, um, the human genome is very large. There's 3,300 million bases. Um, it's you know, 300 feet tall um, if you put it into book form. And that means that it can be really hard to work with. Um, humans are also terrible model organisms for a variety of other reasons, including um, this long generation time, um, on average 30 years nowadays in um, the developed world. Um, also, there's a lot of ethical ramifications with um, you know, doing targeted crosses between individual humans. We really don't like that. Um, and the manipulation of the DNA at the moment is, for both ethical and technical reasons, essentially impossible. So, in contrast, we can use something like the common house mouse, um, which has a much faster generation time, only 10 weeks, um, which I certainly know from personal experience, the way they um, multiply around my house. Um, the genome size is a bit smaller, 2,700 million bases, um, and DNA manipulation, so say I want to make a specific type of change in the DNA um, to maybe uh, reflect a change that happens in human disease, that can take about three months, and there are companies that will actually do this for you. Yeast takes it even a step further, so the generation time for a yeast cell is only 90 minutes. They replicate really, really fast. Um, their base, their genome is 300 times smaller than ours, which makes it faster to read, easier to work with. Um, in or, and in order to make one of those specific targeted changes, only takes about a week to do that in a yeast cell. So even faster than mice. So to really hammer this point home, just think about how much time and effort it takes you to make a loaf of bread versus raise a pet mouse versus bear and raise a child to adulthood. Like these are very, very different scales. And scientists have to think about these differences as well. So when designing an experiment, a scientist has to think about how complex an organism is, and um, in this case, how similar to uh, the human biology an organism is, um, versus how easy is it to use? How quickly will I get results and actually progress our knowledge of this particular disorder? So I'm gonna start with telling you about how people have used Baker's yeast to understand Alzheimer's disease. So Baker's yeast is um, usually uh, considered the oldest model organism. Humans have been intentionally growing yeast um, for the purposes of making wine uh, for literally thousands and thousands of years. Um, in the 1800s uh, was the first time that yeast was used for scientific purposes as uh, researchers and gentlemen scientists were trying to figure out what happens to grape juice as it turns into wine. Uh, in the 1930s, it was when it was formally established as a model organism for understanding the biology of um, all organisms, including humans. And as of this year, there are seven different Nobel Prizes that have been awarded for research that was performed in uh, Baker's yeast. So what can this little guy that you can literally go buy off 
store in the off the shelf in the grocery store tell us about uh, a disease as complex as Alzheimer's that affects an organ as intricate as the human brain. So to give you a brief uh, overview of what Alzheimer's is, many of you are, are probably familiar with this disease. Um, it is the most common form of dementia um, affecting uh, the, the, your memory and other cognitive uh, functions in um, individuals, and it affects millions of Americans. Um, especially as uh, we get better at treating uh, diseases, like infectious diseases, our population will live, your life expectancy is much longer, but we have more prevalence of these um, aging-related diseases like Alzheimer's. And in the brain of an individual with Alzheimer's, what happens is the normal healthy tissue in which you have um, connective tissue and then you have neurons or these brain cells um, forms these clumps of protein. Um, and these clumps of protein are a very characteristic hallmark of this disease. So what can yeast tell us about Alzheimer's disease? Obviously, they do not have brains. They're um, individual single-celled organisms. Um, but we know that Alzheimer's causes neurons to die. And we know, as I mentioned, that these plaques, these clumps of protein, appear in the brain tissue as Alzheimer's progresses. So we didn't know um, at the beginning of, of studying Alzheimer's whether the plaques are actually causing these neurons to die or if they're just something else that arises over the course of the disease and they're unrelated to the fact that the brain cells are dying. So this is a question that people um, could use yeast to study, and this is sort of similar in the brain, is like, you know, you have a healthy brain, it's like Han Solo walking around, doing his normal functions, flying spaceships, um, versus in Alzheimer's disease, the proteins get all clumped up, um, like Han Solo and carbonite. So this is not the scenario we want in, in the brain. So we knew, um, scientists knew what protein, what specific um, little molecular machine was composing these plaques. So they decided to take this particular protein and put it into yeast cells. Because even though they don't form a giant network like your brain does with neurons, um, we may be able to figure out whether this particular protein is causing um, cell death. So these researchers took happy, healthy cells, and they gave them this protein, and they found that the cells then became sick. So this was evidence that this particular protein that's in the plaques is actually causing the cells to become sick, and it's not just that this is something that's happening alongside the, um, the death of brain cells that's unrelated. So this research was actually done um, not too far from us here at Yale. This was uh, done in the lab of Dr. Susan Linquist up at MIT just a few years ago. So since those initial studies, we've learned a lot about what's happening in an individual cell um, during the progression of Alzheimer's. So there's a particular protein, again, one of these molecular machines, um, that sits at the edge of the cell um, in a normal, healthy brain cell. Everybody has this particular protein. Also, another protein that everybody has is this uh, protein that acts like a pair of scissors and actually cuts off a bit of that first protein. And this fragment then floats around outside the cell um, in the rest of the connective tissue of the brain. And all of this is totally fine and happening in all of us right now. Um, but what can happen over time is these protein fragments undergo a change. And that change, as they multiply, makes them more likely to stick together. And they form these clumps. And all of this takes a very, very long time, which is why uh, people who develop Alzheimer's don't do so until uh, later in life. So you get accumulation of more and more of these clumps of, of proteins, and they stick together. And this is sort of similar to um, when you're boiling an egg, and you go through this progression where you have the egg that's all free-flowing and liquidy, um, but as time increases as you're cooking this egg, it gets more and more clumped together um, and less fluid. So this is a problem for the cell because you get these clumps actually sticking to the outside of the cell. And a very, very important, if essentially the most important function of a brain cell is to talk to other brain cells. And if the outside of the cell is all clumped up with these proteins, then it can't talk to other brain cells very well, and it actually will end up um, dying as a result of this. So this is what we see in an actual patient, is these clumps. So a bunch of researchers wondered, if all of this is a result of this initial step where you clipped off a fragment of that protein, can we get rid of that pair of scissors, and then we no longer have the fragment, and then 
we no longer have these chain squeezes, which shouldn't be able to clump together. So is this a way that we could actually treat this disease? So enter the house mouse. Um, this is an organism that I'm sure all of you are very familiar with. It has been living alongside humans essentially since humans have been building houses a very, very long time. Um, in the 1900s were the first genetic studies using mice to figure out how inheritance works, um, and those ob studies obviously apply to humans as well. Um, in 2003, sequencing of the mouse genome revealed that we share 80% um, of the same genes um, as mice, uh, so that makes them a very good model organism to study processes uh, that happen in human cells. And there are 17 different Nobel Prizes that have been awarded for work done in mice. And because of the extensive contributions of the house mouse to our understanding of biology, there's actually a monument um, in Russia dedicated to the house mouse and its um, contributions to genetic research. So, mice are at a different level on this scale of complexity versus ease of use. So they're a little bit harder to use, as I mentioned before, they take longer to grow and um, it takes longer to genetically manipulate them. Um, but they are more um, similar to us on the scale of complexity. They do have complex organs and tissues, including the brain. So that makes them a good model for this new study. So just as researchers could take the protein that makes plaques and put it into yeast, they could also take information about patients with Alzheimer's and put those same uh, modifications into mice so that the mice would have Alzheimer's. And uh, the scientists knew that the mice had Alzheimer's because they also had these clumped plaques of proteins in their brain. So, if the researchers got rid of this pair of scissors protein here in the mice, first they found that mice that lacked it entirely, if they completely got rid of the gene, um, the mice didn't develop normally. So clearly this protein is important at some point for the development of um, a mouse into an adult. But the scientists were able to use a special genetic trick to make it so that this protein was lost, but only after the mouse had finished developing. So it grew into an adult, and then they got rid of this protein. So then, in those mice, they found that um, mice that had symptoms actually recovered, and they had less of this accumulation of plaques in the brain. So this is really exciting. And this work was actually done um, at UConn um, just this very recent, uh, in 2016 and 17. So I've been showing you this uh, pair of scissors to, to sort of communicate what the function of this protein is, but you probably realize that that's not really what it looks like. Um, this is what the protein actually looks like in the cells. And we can use this information to make therapies to potentially treat Alzheimer's patients. So a group of researchers took this particular protein and threw a whole bunch of different molecules at it to see if anything would stick and basically wedge the scissors open so it no longer functioned properly. So as they did this, they scanned literally thousands and thousands of different molecules and eventually they found a candidate that stuck right here and wedged the scissors open so they no longer functioned properly. So after a variety of clinical tests in um, yeast and mice and other organisms, this actually made it to clinical trials, and um, real patients were given this drug to see if it improved their, uh, their outcomes with this disease. And unfortunately, it didn't work as well as hoped, but um, this just emphasizes the fact that scientific research is sort of a, a perpetual cycle, where we took some information about humans, the information that we had plaques in the brains and neuronal death, and we use that information to design studies in yeast, and we learn some more about what's happening in this disease in yeast cells. Then we could take that information and apply it to studies in mice and learn even more. And these studies in mice fueled more research in yeast and also targeted therapies in humans. And since those initial therapies didn't work, we're gonna go back again and do more research in yeast and mice and other model organisms so that ultimately we will be able to find different therapies that will treat this disease in real human patients. But sometimes we really can't find a model organism that is well suited along this, um, this scale of complexity and ease of use. So what do we do then? What as scientists can we do when we get to a point where there is not a, a model somewhere on the scale that can address the question we wanna ask? 
And so at that point, we can turn to computer models to help us gain an even better understanding of what's happening in real cells. And so that's what Max is going to talk to you about.